There isn't a day that doesn't go by that I don't think of these things. You know, the, the things that, that, at least what I went through. Serious thing that ever happened to me in my life. He must have been an officer because he said there are two, kind of pe two kinds of people on this speech, those that are dead and those that are gonna be dead. I remember that. We lost a lot of people out there. A lot of good people. Well, the proudest moment in your life of being an American is in a, in a spot like that, you know. I was very proud. Nineteen forty two and forty three are these desperate years that the war hung in the balance. Everybody wanted to get revenge. They wanted uh, volunteers for a dangerous mission. Doolittle's plane is first down the runway. My name is Damien Lewis. In the year 2000, I was chosen to portray a World War II veteran by the name of Richard D. Winters in HBO's Band of Brothers. For me, it turned out to be much more than just another acting job. It was a defining moment in my life and provided an opportunity to bring honor to a humble but proud man whom I came to admire and respect. Every place they moved, they moved on the double. I looked at him and I thought, that's the kind of fellas I want to go to combat with. You're going to go to war. I want to go with the best. And that is the best looking men, troops that I've seen. We dedicate a monument to the leadership of noble men. We reflect on the proud history of the heroic men that served here. Ladies and gentlemen, the Richard D. Winters Leadership Monument recognizing all those who led the way on D-Day. Over here, this is the this is the box cars that we came in with. And the, over here, as we came out from the box cars, was the assembling of the people right here. And that's where Mangalas or one of the other doctors performed the selection. When they came and people and the guest chambers were busy, which was practical on a daily basis. The people sometimes you see were sitting in what so called the waiting area until there is room for them in the guest chambers to be able to go in and to be killed. And so this is called Zhinki, and that's they were sitting and waiting. The waiting room, can you imagine? The waiting room to be taken in to be killed.
oh, there are so many stories to tell from here. If this area, if this tree, if this ground, if that ground over there could only talk. What, what took place on this, on this area is just unbelievable, undescribable. I still cannot imagine today that this is the truth, that this is what happened here in the 20th century, in the heart of Europe, in, in one of the most cultural advanced countries, that people could commit such atrocities. Bob and I started rounding up casualties and uh, we used a farm cart to uh, transport the wounded that couldn't walk. Church was the best thing I could think of and it was, it was the safest. I would guess we had 40 or 50 American wounded. The church was packed with uh, casualties. They were young men much like us, except they were wearing a different uniform. They were all grateful for the help that they were getting and relieved that they were still alive. The Germans were treated the same as the Americans, the Americans were treated the same as the Germans were, and uh, we treated them all the same. I tell my grandchildren, uh, my role in the war, uh, I was there sort of an ob observer. I wasn't a rifleman uh, killing people. Division were battle hardened. They were fighting a war. They needed some some downtime. These people had suffered greatly under the Germans. It was an oppressive environment. Harry was thinking of maybe having a Christmas party. He organized it. He asked the company cooks to make donuts and cookies for the children, and he asked the, the GIs to donate whatever they could to, to hand out little gifts to the kids. They made hot chocolate from our D rations. You know, the big step was then finding somebody to play St. Nicholas, and that's when he approached his roommate, Richard, and said, you know, we need you. I did ask him at one point, what is St. Nicholas doing? I pat the kids on the head and chuck them under the chin, so that's what I did. I felt good that the kids were laughing. I don't know that they knew I was a, a soldier. I was disguised enough with this outfit. I was just having a good time. And after that day, you know, they still had a war to fight and they still had a job to do. Well, it was all over, so we were back in uniform and plain old GIs. And they pretty much forgot about the event then. They moved on and the war continued. I don't recall ever thinking about it. Wills again because it never came up in conversation. The people in Wills felt they had to pay honor to these soldiers. I got a letter and he said, I would ask you, would you like to come and help me by being St. Nicholas? I remember the priest from 77. He said, if Luxembourg should live another thousand years, we will never forget 
the GIs who gave their blood so that we may live in freedom. And I guess that says it all. Thank you for coming. To me, it, it was a validation of what those guys went through and what they did, and that the people that they, they liberated were still grateful. I thought it was fantastic. You were one of the children? Yeah. Hi. How are you? They vowed that they would, they would always remember this group of soldiers in this event, and they, to this day they have. made a big difference. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. We are under attack. The attack apparently was made on all naval and military this activity. This is the real McCoy. The White House announces Japanese attack on Pearl We knew it was American and America was being attacked. I knew then that, that probably I'd have to get enlisted. We made a commitment that we wouldn't wait to be drafted. The planes coming over the Navy housing, they were coming over to go down into Pearl Harbor. Everybody knew exactly what was going on as soon as that first plane came over and dropped the first torpedo. I said, the Japanese are here. Just below the blue waters of Pearl Harbor, the USS Arizona still bleeds her oil. The rising beads are referred to as black tears. Roughly every 20 seconds, a solitary droplet floats slowly to the surface. An oily sheen fans out from the remains of the Arizona, mixing with the warm waters of the Pacific. On Saturday, December 6, 1941, the battleship had taken on well over a million gallons of fuel. The next morning, Sunday, December 7th, at her mooring off Fort Island in the heart of Pearl Harbor, the Arizona was a fiery mess of steel, burning human flesh, and oily black smoke. The 30,000-ton battleship had become a blazing tomb for almost 1,200 sailors and Marines on board. Just 18 minutes into Japan's surprise attack on the Hawaiian island of Oahu, a bomb from a Japanese plane ignited the Arizona's forward ammunition magazine. The time, was 8.06 a.m. on Sunday, December 7th, 1941. As we stood there, we heard a tremendous explosion. The Arizona's apocalyptic blast along Battleship Row in Pearl Harbor could be seen and felt across the Hawaiian island of Oahu. People were just blown all over the place. Oh, I was on fire. We knew it was a war right then and there. I just hope they don't forget. Says, remember Pearl Harbor. a point where I could see that I had to talk to God in a real hurry. I remember looking up to God and I yelled, God, no matter what it is you want me to do, I'll do it.
men were just dropping out like flies, and when they did, they were invariably killed. The world outside did not know that any of this was happening. You have men who participated in the largest surrender in American military history end up engineering one of the greatest victories that really changed the course of the Pacific War. They didn't believe any of us would live to tell what horrible things they did. Thank God we have. You combine all of the news that's coming out of the Pacific, you have a nation that's outraged, and rightfully so. Prior to the Davao escape, in the efforts of Ed Dias and his comrades, most Americans had thought of the war as something that was taking place over there. And this really brought the story home of what our troops were enduring. These are things that get embedded in your mind. You never forget it. I, I, I didn't talk about this for 40, 45 years. It, I tried to forget it. We were exposed to fire from the moment we went through that fence. We came in low and fast. They had artillery, they had tanks, they had everything. They would throw everything they had at us. We were pretty easy targets for the Germans at that time. And you're paddling with your rifle butts or whatever, and you're, you know, you're going there and guys are getting hit. Of all them guys, like, the kid who had killed sitting next to me in the boat trying to get across that river. It just, let's get the, get the hell out of this damn boat. When we went into Harrisbach, we went head on into this German battalion. And all of a sudden, a tank opens fire on us with machine guns. And he saw that tank as being a threat to his people. And if you're gonna threaten his people, you ain't get along with Bag at all. Unbelievably, he took this tank uh, on by himself. And then he jumped on top of the tank and threw a grenade inside it with another explosion. But he saved lives by doing this. And that's what you call extraordinary heroism above and beyond. That's what I feel. We busted the locks on the concentration camp and we opened the doors and each one of them was full of people. These are things that get embedded in your mind. You never forget it. And How do you explain a situation like this to somebody who's never seen it? We went into the town and we made every single man, woman, and child go out and we marched them out to the concentration camp to see exactly what existed out there. I would like to thank you personally for what you have done. Because of you, I'm alive here today. I'm glad to be here and appreciate shaking hands with all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> we did something that was worthwhile. And when you see it in the faces of children and everything, then you know that your effort was worth it. I'll never forget what I saw here. This is one of the few things of war that uh, you can't believe that people could treat other people the way they were treated.
You look at this place, be proud that you're an American. There are 8,301 Americans here. That all those freedoms we enjoy and the liberties that we take for granted and our children and our grandchildren weren't free. These are the men that fought for those things we believe in. Well, I think he was aggressive and all of those other things, you know, the good luck, the fortunate, intelligent, and, uh, and persistent and consistent, you know, he could count on his men and he, he did. He's one of those guys, no matter what it took, he was gonna take care of his people. And that's what impressed me with him more than anything else. And if he advanced, he went with him. It was war, we're at grips of the enemy. And you've got a mission to do, it involves the enemy, and there's risk involved. A good soldier will carry out his mission. You lead from the front, and men will follow. Sixteen point one million Americans served during World War II. Maybe your father was a GI landing on the beaches of Normandy, or an uncle was on a B-17 crew flying dangerous missions over Germany. Your grandfather may have been a Marine fighting in dense jungles on some small island in the Pacific. Millions more served as nurses or doctors or worked in armament factories on the home front as Rosie the Riveters. Others held administrative jobs. One part of World War II that I personally had never really spent much time looking into was my own family involvement. The Second World War was a conflict that claimed more than 50 million lives. Every family was affected in some way. My dad, Walter Gray, on the left, was a little young for action and came in right at the end of the war. My uncle Bob Gray, on the right, was a little bit older than dad and served on a destroyer escort in the Pacific. Another uncle Bob on the left, who was married to my dad's sister Ruth, was a medic in the Battle of the Bulge. He didn't talk about it much. My grandfather, on the right, was a World War I veteran. When I was young, my father once mentioned his other brother, John Gray, was also in World War II and worked on something called the Manhattan Project. Uncle Jack, as he was most often known to me, eventually went on to become one of the most respected men in the field of atomic energy following World War II. Jack Gray passed away in 1997 at the age of 75. It wasn't until I was older did I fully understand the importance of the Manhattan Project and how my uncle's small role in it became a lifelong pursuit of finding a way to harness this destructive force for peaceful purposes. My uncle didn't carry a gun in World War II. His mind is what the United States needed most at a crucial time in our history. Uncle Jack's story is personal to me and also just one of 16.1 million individual American accounts from World War II. Perhaps your family has its own. share this moment that we went through something very special. It was pitch dark. You couldn't see nothing in front of you. And we started to load the troops up. We got up about three o'clock in the morning and went down the rope ladders. We were assigned to landing craft assault because we were gonna be the initial assault wave on D-Day. We were all the bunch of kids. 
23, 24, 25 year olds. We had the mission to take out uh, these guns that were pointed at uh, Omaha Beach, Utah Beach. Before we left the ship, and we were instructed that not to bring anybody back except the wounded or the dead. We had to use helmets to bail water out of the bottom of the boat, and uh, it was a tough ride in. As I was going into the beach, I could hear the bullets hitting out of the side of my boat. The 88 start coming at us, and, and traces are going over our heads. I know the crew I took in was about 36 soldiers, and there wasn't one of them that made it. I yelled up at God, and I said, hey, God, you know, if there's anything you want me to do in my life, I will do it, as long as you get me off this beach. And at that particular point, somebody yelled, 29, let's go. By God, we get up, and we get up off the beach and into the burn. I was uh, exhausted and scared and wet. And I don't know what all, cold. I could see a lot of soldiers there just floating in the water, and it was a hell of a sickness sight. Something I tried to get out of my mind, but it's just stuck there, and I just can't shake it off. Have you been to the cemetery? Have you ever been back to that cemetery? Many that, times. That, uh, that's the emotional center, of course, of the whole thing. It's a really, really, uh, really moves you every time you go there. When there's people say, you're a hero now. Those guys under the white crosses are the heroes. That's right. I thought all my life how I, why did I, how did I make it, and so many others didn't. And uh, I don't, I don't have the answer to that, but it's, I've thought about it all my life. I, uh, we changed the world, whether you know it or not. We actually were involved in changing the way the world was operating. When they pay you $100 a month to be a paratrooper, to jump behind the lines, that is blood money. This is great to be standing here and know that I can stand up and not be shot. There were a thousand other good rifle companies like ours where we would have never won the war. I got shot down during World War II. I spent six months in the French underground. I was shot down over Belgium, returning from a bombing raid to Germany. I packed my car and went down to Westover Field and enlisted in the Army Air Corps. There was no regular Air Force. I had a private pilot's license. We had red, white, and blue fever. Everybody volunteered. I had five, they didn't come back. They were killed 
in the firefight on the mission that we shot down. Those um, priests did help. They had no experience with the underground. None of them had ever seen an American in their lives. But they knew one thing, I was an American. And I had been shot down flying on a bombing mission that was designed to help them. Not me, them. And uh, they helped us. I don't think we were heroes. I think we all did what we thought had to be done at the time, but we didn't do it to be a hero. We just did it because I'm gonna help you, and but I know you're gonna help me. And between the two of us, we're gonna get the job done.